Welcome to the Life Story Podcast, brought to you by the Living Memory Association. This edition takes us back in time with Jackie Dennis, Scotland's first ever pop star. Known as the Golden Kid and the Lilt with the Kilt, Jackie signed a huge £50,000 contract in 1958 and hit the charts with La Da and the Purple People Eater. We hear tales of appearing at Perry Como's show at the age of 15, representing Britain at the Brussels Festival, staying at the Plaza in New York, and meeting Frank Sinatra and Sammy Davis Jr. Jackie tells us how his manager, Evie Taylor, turned down a slot on the fateful tour with Buddy Holly, the Big Bopper, and Richie Valens, and of topping the bill at the Empire Theatre, living next door to John Lennon, and being backed by Dusty Springfield. Over to Jackie, in conversation with Jack Gillen and David McLean. So as I was saying in my initial telephone call, this is more just to add a bit of colour. Because your story is already out there. So I just I wanted to speak to you to get a better idea of, of what it was like in your heyday. But, I mean, first of all, I've just watched your little clip on the BBC documentary, going for your scrapbook at uh-huh. home and all that. But did you watch it yourself last I night? I watched it last night, yeah, with a with the wife. No doubt my, my son's in or they would be watching it. You know, I was over the moon. It, it was Actually, it was Jack. They had phoned Jack, and Jack got in contact with me. And he says, is it all right to give them the, your telephone number? I says, of course. And it all went from there. So that's a result of us doing yeah. that article a yeah. couple of years ago, yeah. Excellent. It, was, it came from the little thing in Old Ricky and all that, you know, which I'm grateful for, because I, I never knew uh, that people would remember me, you know, going back oh, to 1958. But even when I went... And, to do the interview for uh, the show Rip It Up. The cameraman, they say, oh, we remember the things and all that. And it was good, you know. There was a lot of things. It's television, so you're only allocated so long, you know. Yes, yes. But uh, there was a lot of things in the interview that I told them about, like, for example, doing the desert, and which never came up at all, which was a, a big achievement. I they did mention the Como show, and of course they showed uh, me on the on the Como show, and it was true. About I think for their purposes in telling the story of Scotland's pop history, yeah, you, they're obviously branding you as the guy who kicked it all off, you know. Well, and yeah. that's in a way without kind of your the rest of your, your anecdotes and everything losing any kind of value. I think that's what we need to really touch upon, you know. Yeah. That's what you're going to be recognised for, and yeah. that's that's amazing. You yeah, know? nobody else can say that. No, they can't kind of take that away from me. It's the thing that I was the first uh, one mm-hmm. in the hip parade. Paul uh, McCartney will never be the first Scotch pop star. <laughs> <laughs> He's maybe the first from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> when you think of it, it, it was an achievement and to be so young at that age. At that incredible. age, nobody would have thought of it. Like when I started in the business. On the six five special, the first show I ever done, as you know, and I came on at the right time, at the right place. It was the first year of the six five special, so I was a new up and coming star, if you want to put it that way. There was other people in the show, and that would be nineteen fifty eight. So that would be nineteen. So we are actually talking sixty years ago, almost. Yeah. Getting old, that's my anniversary. It's as good as a golden Do you wedding. remember when it was? Yes, February. I should have remembered that because you, it was my sister's birthday. She was born on the 1st of February and my mother was 26. It always reflects on that. Now, your parents signed your first contract. Yeah. And we've already been into it. It was a bit of a rotten contract and you, you've compared it to the Bay City Rollers. Oh, in yeah. Ter- in terms of, you know, Rip the, the deal that you got. Actually, the show that I was on was really... It was like my life, rip it up, <laughs> rip it off, <laughs> you know. <laughs> How about the groupies, Jackie? Oh, there was plenty of that. There was plenty of groupies. <laughs> <laughs> the lasses and all that used to come backstage and all that, you know. But it got too much. So while they were playing God Save the Queen, I was getting flung into a, a, a chauffeur-driven car oh, and away. Was- which was sad because they had paid money to see me, you know, and they wanted autographs, you know. But so, so there was a bit of that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you never actually yeah, the management said, so get him in there. I don't, oh, I Get him in the limo. It was yeah. a 50,000, what was it, a 50,000 pound? 50,000 pound contract. But what did they call you? Was it 50,000 pound kid? That's it, golden kid. The golden kid. The I mean, all the lasses wanted to meet the golden kid. 
The one that I hated <laughs> was <laughs> the loot with the kilt. <laughs> that's what they call the loot with the kilt. I said, that's terrible. <laughs> was, wasn't the hair as well? The hair was bigger than that. <laughs> oh, the hair was really big. Look at it now. <laughs> so who, I mean, trying to handle this, who were you trying to imitate or who's influential for you? Yeah, well, in terms, terms of sound your voice and everything like that, because it's quite distinctive. Thanks. Yeah, thank you know, it's different from, like, say, Lonnie Donegan or other acts of that era. Well, I would think the, the voice that I had at the time would definitely be Frankie Lyman and the teenagers who did Why Do Fools Fall in Love, oh, yeah. the original. He was 13 year old, so I would put my, myself in the same class as that. So he was a youngster as well? He was a youngster, 13 year old. Yeah. He was like Michael Jackson I see. of his day yeah. in America. And probably you could class me like Scotland's Michael Jackson. Yeah. You yeah. know, so in that era. Yeah. You know. From, because of the, your youth. Your youth and everything. Uh, yeah. Then, of course, if you go into the hip parade later on, there was the young groups like Musical Youth, Lena Savaroni. It all happened really fast, didn't it? Oh, really fast. So you're 50, were you 15 when you were on Perry Como Show? Yes, and a week after it, I was 16. Do you consider yourself Leith born or Edinburgh born? Because this is a bone of contention at the moment. Seeing you well, described as both, so. Yeah, I, I was born in Brunswick Road. Which is Edinburgh, technically. And I was born in the house at 44 Brunswick Road. Yeah. And I used to always think that was Leith. We were going to Leith Walk School, my mm -hmm. primary, yeah. then Leith Academy. So, so you're more of, Leither than Edinburgh. You're, I'm, yeah, you're more, more than attached, I'm more Leither than Edinburgh. Yeah. I, think uh, that, I think that's fair to say, isn't it? If I went to the Royal Hive, which I could have done because of my bursary, I would definitely be in <laughs> Edinburgh. But you're living on that side of town. Uh -huh. You're going to spend your time shopping, oh, going to school, playing in Leith. Play in, yeah. in Leith. You're shopping, right. you're shopping the Kirkgate. Well, uh, your mum's shopping the Kirkgate. I used to play at Leith Links when I was young. Go down, just the bottom of leaf links, walk down, have my game of football and all that. Then, boys that we got talking to, who maybe went to Royal High and they said, you're going for a game of football, we'd go up to the King's Park, well, Queen's Park now, yeah. and we'd play up at the King's Park. I would love to have been a footballer. Did you ever go and see the Hibs? I remember when we got <laughs> hammered by Motherwell, I think it was 1954 or something like that, and... I got a lot of stick when I went to school because a lot of them were heart supporters and I was a hip I mean, it's good for you think of it now. We got really hard me by Motherwell. I think we got beat about 6 2 in the semi final of the cup and I was heartbroken, you know. Went to school and all I got all day was, Is your mother well? For mother, <laughs> the classmates, I used to say, If you say it once more, I'll kill you. So, about four or five weeks later, Hibs played Hearts at Town Castle, right? Mm -hmm. And we beat the Hearts. We, Jackie Fry, scored the goal, uh, and Johnny Hamilton, or something like that. Uh, yeah, we yeah, won 2 yeah. 0. Great game. And of course, I got blown back on all the classmates who were Hearts supporters. And I said, <laughs> Ah, the Hibs really gave them a heart attack. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the ball burst. <laughs> After that, we never said any more. <laughs> we all just went to the race going forever, eh? <laughs> so you're, you're 15. Do you, rem do you remember the, the sort of feeling, the exhilaration of jetting off? I'm guessing coming from Brunswick Road in the 50s, you probably didn't know that many people who'd been abroad, let alone on a oh, plane. No. no. The first time I ever went on a plane was to go down to London for to do the editions. The next time before I went to America, I represented Britain in the, the Brussels uh, festival. It was all, all nations together. Not like a Eurovision, it wasn't a competition. Somebody from Britain represented, and I happened to be the one for Britain. Mm. And that was in Ghent Stadium, uh, you know, in Belgium. And that was the first long journey, really, I, I had to go to America and ra arrive in there, coming down the plank, if you wipe it from the plane, then going into a big limousine, crossing Brooklyn Bridge, yes. seeing all these skyscrapers, I just couldn't <sighs> believe it. The hotel I was staying at 
right opposite Central Park, the bar was in Plaza, and I was up on the 24th floor. You were in the Plaza? Yeah, bar was in Plaza, that's where I stayed. Yeah. It was one of the top notches, you know. Aye. It was through Pericombe's management, they had booked me in there, plus Evie and her husband, Evie Taylor, naturally, who went with me, my agent. And when I went to look at the window, I just went dizzy, just just the height. And I, I said, oh my God, the people were like, we ants. And I'm saying, oh, this is, you know. When I went up the Empire State Building, I'll never forget that. So fast, you know, woof, to look from all ends, from east, west, north and south, the fantastic panorama. Which was still it was the, things I saw in the movies. It was been the tall, you know it was still I mean? been the tallest building in the world. Yeah, it was it's still the tallest building then. Yeah. I just couldn't believe this has happened. I started in February. This is October. What six months, yeah. seven months? Boom. So, the you, highest you've been was Arthur Seat before I, that, probably. So how did you cope with that song? I couldn't sort of believe it. Wrong. Honest, honest, Jack. I could not believe it. I didn't know where I was because. One minute I'd be in Brussels, the next minute I'd be in Cardiff, yeah. you know, doing all the shows. Sweden, I went to Sweden. I loved it, played the Tivoli Gardens, which I adored. So what, to bear for such a young, a young guy, looking back now, do you feel that you had the right level of protection for such a young person, you know? I had the bodyguards. Everybody had bodyguards. You know, the, your Tommy had them and all that. But the, the things that I hated about show business, and this is the God's truth, I loved going to the movies since I was a baby. I loved musicals like Fred Astaire, and I loved all these types of things. And historic things like Demetrius and the Gladiators, I loved all that type of thing. When I was in show business, I could go to a cinema, I had to go in 15 minutes after it started because of the fans, and I never saw an ending. I had to come out 15 minutes before. I was a prisoner in a room I couldn't go out or anything, and that was my life. My life was waking up in the morning, breakfast, so and so and so, -so out for a drive, away down to the studios to do a television thing or a radio thing, back in, then on to the theatre, sitting in my dressing room till I went on, finishing my dressing room, back to my hotel or wherever I was. How long was that period where you're famous at such a level where you... I would say Could at least you? five years, at least five years at that so, level. How, did it make you feel sort of lonely, isolated? I was lonely. I, I was never off the phone, phoning my mother and reversing the charges. And I had nobody. The nearest I came to be really happy was when I did the Como show and we had a day off, no rehearsals. And Irv Chesser, who was Como's manager, arranged for me to go to Coney Island. Oh, so you could actually be a kid again, so yep. I'm for... Ronnie Como, Perry Como's son, who is 16, myself at 15, <coughs> Earth Chesser's daughter, I've got photos in the house, we're having fun at Coney mm -hmm. Island. I'm alive, I'm a youngster yeah, yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. After that, back in... Perry Como took to you, didn't he? he was, uh... I loved him. He was such a gentleman, and he gave me one of the the greatest accolades that I'll ever have. He said that Conway Twitty and I were the two great rising stars. And he says he's, they're such great performers. And that's in the scrapbook. I do miss it, and that's true. Yeah. But he always kept in contact with you, didn't he, Perry? Christmas card. Mm -hmm. And when he came over, it must have been, I was a postman then, so it was about 30 years since I'd seen him. And he came over to do the Usher Hall. Mm -hmm. And I got a phone call. As you know, John Gibson was like a half cousin to me at the evening the news. news. Right. And John <laughs> phoned me and he says, Como's manager has been on the phone. They want to arrange to send a car for you, take you up to the Usher Hall, go backstage, have a drink after the show at the Caledonian Hotel where we staying, bring mum and dad. And I said, lovely. So, Limousine came, went backstage. He remembered me and he says, Whoa, Jackie. And my mother <coughs> loved Perry Coleman, that was a favourite singer. Gave her a kiss, and I, honest, I thought, 
my mother was so embarrassed, <laughs> she didn't know where to look. And he says, well, long time no see, because he always had glasses like that. So it's still Mr. Dennis, and I says, it is Mr. Como. And he says, I'll have to mention that you're in the auditorium, which he did. This young lad from Edinburgh, like a Scottish Rick and Nelson, but I said <laughs> Edinburgh. And he corrected me and said, it's Edinburgh. <laughs> so he says, I'm in here in Edinburgh. And he says, he's sitting in the audience. We haven't seen each other for years. Right. Mr. Jackie Dennis. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Just didn't know what to do. And that was years after you had met 30 years. Good God, yeah. But you met a fair few people. You've talked in the past about Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah. But not everybody was so polite. No, he he tells a story about Frank Sinatra. <laughs> well, I was introduced to him, he turned round, swiveled round, shook my hand and more or less told me, <laughs> off. <laughs> it was too busy. The other thing too was like, when I did the Desert Inn Doesn't in Las Vegas, yeah. before I done the Desert Inn, there was talk of me to go on a tour with Buddy Holly, who I met, and his manager, and there was a lot of discussion for to go on a tour with Buddy Holly in America with Big Bopper and Richie Valens. But yes. Evie Taylor was correct in every way. She turned around and she says, it's a young boy of 15 year old for to do a city here, next day a city, it is far too much for him. So, so while she did the pee off to a large extent, she did support you. If it wasn't for Evie Taylor, she went over and told them all about me, mm. and I happened to be, at that time, also in the William Morris Agency yeah. of Chesa, who she was speaking to, and coming along was Johnny Ray, who Evie knew from Mike and Benny Winters. Mm -hmm. They had done the London Palladium, Sunday night at the London yeah. Palladium. And she went, oh, hello, Johnny. And he turned around and says, oh, hi. He says, what are you doing here? She says, I'm trying to sell Jackie. He said, oh, the little Scots guy, he's great. And that's how Johnny Ray said, within five minutes, he had signed the contract mm -hmm. for me for to go, mm -hmm. go over and do the Como yeah. show. That was luck again, mm -hmm. right place. Whose idea was it to kind of market your brand as a kind of new age Harry Lauder? Who, whose idea was it? Was that Evie's? No, it was myself. Was it yourself? I wanted to wear the coat so that I could represent Scotland. It was never a gimmick. If you see the 65 special <laughs> movie with the doing la di da, mm. I had tartan trousers on. Aye. That's the way I was going to be, and I says, I'd like to wear my, a kilt and be proud. And she says, says we Well, fun. that's it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of reporters at the time, people like Henry Ray hey, from the Daily Record, <coughs> Gordon Irvin from the Evening Citizen in Glasgow, they used to say, This is all gimmick, this Aye. kilt. And I had lots of fights with Gordon Irvin. I never got a good review from Gordon Irvin. And used to say, he's only 15 years old, what does he know about show business? That was the type of thing. But in the end, when he saw me on stage for to review me, he couldn't believe it because I'd done impressions. I'd done Jerry Lewis, I'd done Dean Martin. I tap danced with the girls in the show. Ba -ba -ba -ba. So you weren't just a singer, you were an yeah. all-round performer. And that's... The first person that says I was an all-round performer was Frankie Vaughan. He says, the real lad's an all-round performer. He says, he's kicking his leg doing an impression of me. He says, he's brilliant. And that was the first time Gordon Irvin turned around and says, I was amazed. I take everything back. This lad, this little lad, is an all-round entertainer. I never got on my way. He always used to rib me. Yeah. But he did, in the end, turn round. Mm -hmm. you, you, you had an unpleasant experience with Sinatra, but Sammy Davis Jr. was a genius. A, a genius. You had a bit of a rapport with him, didn't you? Oh, he was such a, a great guy. There was a, a lot of things. Sammy Davis Jr., well, he was in, uh, well, you know the score, he had to go through the, the kitchens. He was right. yelling through the front. Yeah. And, and what did I, you think of that at the time? I thought it was diabolical. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought all these things was... It's the same with the South Africa when it all happened in South Africa. Yeah. Because Scotland, you know, 1950 Scotland wasn't it quite as progressive as it is today in terms of no. attitudes and everything like that. But you were still 
appalled by what you saw in America? Because oh, yeah. it would have been... No, it was, dead, it was dreadful. In the streets with the guns and things like that, you know, you, you could be shopping and things like that, and all you hear is, everybody down! And a big bloody gun, you know, somebody stealing something. Oh, 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 Did you ever see anything like that? No. But I could imagine but what it would be like. Carrying guns. I don't know what I would have done. I would have probably crashed through a window or something like that. What, 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 was, the most, what was the most terrifying thing that ever happened to you in your showbiz career? Well, the most terrifying thing would definitely be I could have been dead if I'd been on that oh, tour I mean, yes. with Buddy Holly. I was just, just lucky. If you had gone on that tour, you would have been on the flight that. That's right. And funny enough, when they did crash, I came back for to do the pantomime. And when I finished at Edinburgh, they, they took the pantomime over to Glasgow Empire. They used to do that a lot. Aye, aye. And he came through and I says, I am lucky. And he would tell us this. He came over that Buddy Holly, Big Bopper, Richie Valens, had all perished. The music so died. The music died, Don mm. McLean. Mm -hmm. So you were doing Edinburgh panto at that time? I was doing, well, uh, in, started in Edinburgh, yeah, went over to Glasgow. Glasgow. I could have been on that tour. Hence the reason I, I was lucky. That's why I stayed in there. It was Evie Taylor. She did protect me. And she sold me. She was a great manageress. There's no doubt about what it. What age was she? Evie, at my time, when I was 15, she'd been maybe a lady about 40 odds. 40 odds, right. Yeah, yeah. But she had handled quite a few stars, but That's I was the biggest star. She was handling people like the Lana sisters, for example. Dusty Springfield mm -hmm. right. was one of the, the girls of the Lana sisters. And the Lana sisters used to back me. Dusty Springfield was one of them. But then we changed it because Evie wanted younger. They were a bit older than me, but so she wanted younger. Then the honeys came in and started being my backing group with, naturally, John Barry Seven, one of the greatest conductors you'll ever meet and a writer of music. Look at all the things he's done out right, in Africa. Right. My favourite movie, Dances with Wolves. Yeah. You know I've still got that on tape. I taped it. It's been out now about 30 years and I still yeah. watch it. Beyond Laddie Da, Purple People Eater, Linton Addy. I don't think I've heard anything else that you've done. How many recordings did you do over your career? About 10. All singles? No, there was an EP where Laddie Da my my dream, Miss Valerie, you're the greatest. Then I had a thing called Lucky Ladybug and Gingerbread. Frankie Avalon had the hit over in America and I done it over here. Crap songs. But <laughs> they sold. I suppose they were appropriate for your age though, right? Yeah. They? Well, yeah. in South Africa, Purple People Eater went in a storm. Mm. It was a number one and Australia and New Zealand. Hence the reason I played Australia and New Zealand. That was well, in the 60s. Australia and New Zealand? Oh yeah, 60s. I don't think you've ever told us that before. Huh? I've got so many things that have been great. Were you a support actor or were you top of the bill? Were you, where I, was was, I was sharing top billing with Nat Jackley, who was a great British comic, mm -hmm. and it was called Artists and Models. Then I did the club scene in Australia. You must people. have gone down a storm in Australia, with all the expats uh, and all that, yeah? Yeah, but I'd done a lot of Scots things over there. For the memories of the Scots Pats, a thing was written for me by Des Lane, who was my best friend, yeah. who discovered me, by the way, with Mike and Ben the Winters. And Des wrote this lovely melody. And then I went and I did about three or four songs come along Aye. and things like that, all Scots songs. They loved that. Plus they did my other records and things like that. But because of Purple People Eater, being a hit in South Africa, I went over to South Africa and Hugo Coletti, who was Eve, Evie Boswell's husband, was the promoter over there. Because of the record being great, a song had came out just after Purple People Eater and I recorded it just for South Africa and it went in at the hit parade and it was called You're Gonna Laugh At This, I've Got To Sing This, it was Ooh ee, ooh ah ah, ting tang, walla walla bing bang. Ooh ee, ooh ah ah, ting tang, walla walla bang bang. My friend, which talk to I was in love with you, bo 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 bo. And but that, you, you that had, recorded that, and that was a number one in South Africa. You did, you did a lot of that kind of saccharine pop. Oh yeah, but your voice was suited to it. Yeah, there were silly songs. 
Your they, favorite, like your Galantanagi yeah. was a traditional yeah, a song, a real Scots song. In my records, the backing group was Lord Rockingham, Hootsman, there's a Miss Lewis about this house, Harry oh. Robinson. And he came up and he says to me, must be a Scots song. And I said, well, Linton Addy's a good song. She said, we'll get a beat on to it. While I was doing Linton Addy, the other side was Call Me Prima, more than ever, once again. Got in the top 30 or something like that. Harry says, that was great, Linton Addy, and we've done a good arrangement, which I did on the, the Como show. Four weeks later, he decided to make a record. Linton Addy, Hootsman. Da 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 went to number one worldwide. And he says it was because of Linton Addy. <laughs> I recorded it with the group and said, we'll call it Hootsman. It's a moose. Loose. A moose. That's loose. It's brilliant, yeah. That could have been mine. You could have <laughs> <laughs> for me. <laughs> I mean, I haven't heard the original rendition of it. It's like kind of Scottish folk injected with 12 bar yeah. blues. It's really good. It's really up tempo. It is. And Linton Addy was like that. And that's what you did. Hey, the song is gotten boom, 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 boom. And all the dancers and the Como Show Highland dancing and all this. It was great. But the worst thing that ever happened to me, John Barry, he wrote all the music for doing my shows and all that when he was my, my group. And he turned around and says, There's a little fellow I've met, Johnny Worth, and he's written this song, Ideal for You, Jackie. And he said, But I want to do a different thing. Well, as you know, rock and roll, what was the most important instrument in rock and roll? Guitars? Yeah. It drove it. Bass? Yeah. Your sax. <laughs> and I says, and what do you want to do with it? He says, I want to put violins in this. I says, and I laughed. <laughs> and we all laughed. Evie Taylor, us all. And he says, well, the lad, it's a good song and all that. I heard the song and I says, you have to put a sax in it and guitars. No, I want to do it different. So he gave it to Adam Faith. What do you want to do? Da da da, da da da, da da da, da the plucking of the strings. And I says, what a fool we were. And yeah, as you know, that was a big hit, wasn't it? Huge. Yeah. Adam sold five million. Mm -hmm. Five million records. Yeah. And nobody, I said no. And he also done for Buddy Holly, it doesn't matter anymore with the violence. And what's in rock and roll now? The violence always take over. It's not the only time that's happened. How come you didn't do it? My agency is too much for me. I was 15 year old and what these tours in America, you'd be in Chicago one night, that you'd be Salt Lake City the next. She says, You're still really you couldn't do it. So instead of doing that, you came over to do Panto here? Yeah, and the I, yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> which, was, which is a better a But better the irony now. of it is, that Buddy Holly, they had to get to that show. And the pilot says, no way mm -hmm. we can fly out. Mm -hmm. And they bribed the pilot. That is the story of it. Yep. Tells you and Don McLean right. say, American Pie. And the story is Buddy Holly says, but we've got to get to that shop or, or else we'll lose the contract. A desperation. Desperation. Thing. And that's what it was. And it was a different pilot. They were to go on this plane. And the boy says, no way I can take you. We're not leaving. Aye. But they went up, and probably another pilot says, Well, give me the money, mm -hmm. and I'll get you there. To take. I think they were going to Lubbock or something like that in, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just one of these things. It's the same as Eddie Cochran, the smash, going along driving a car on the M1. Boom! Now, we've obviously, we were here at what was formerly the Empire Theatre. Do you recall when was the first time you took to the stage here? First time I took to the stage here. Would have been top of the bill. It would have been roughly about September. 58. 58. 58 was my big year. Mm -hmm. That's when I toured Sweden, Belgium, yeah. America, the lot, Germany. And you were able to perform here because you weren't with Buddy Holly. <laughs> no. Mm. That's true. I take it a lot of your family members were attending these early shows. And oh, yeah. My mother was backstage all the time. And she used to sit in the wee dressing room while I was on. My mother was my biggest fan, naturally. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was a, a very, very good entertainer. I think that's who I took it off of. My dad played the accordion. He loved 
Jimmy Shand, and we were brought up listening to my dad playing the accordion. And then when I was eight year old, I went to see a movie called Jolson Story, and I fell in love with it. So I used to blacken my face up at eight year old and do impressions of Al Jolson, which I still do. You know, I can still do Al Jolson, that Jerry Lewis, my name, you know, and still do all them. Then I, you can do people like uh, Michael Crawford and things like that. I used to do all them. You said that you were, uh, just before you'd signed your contract, you were learning a trade? Yeah, I was a plumber for two weeks. <laughs> Seven and a tanner. Like Alan Longmuir. Like Alan Longmuir well, so. aye, that's right. God Plum, bless him. That was sad, that. Mm -hmm. aye. But he was always quite an old person, Alan Longmuir. He went through quite a few illnesses. But it must have been a bug or something in Mexico. Did you, did you know them? I'd met them. I'd met only Alan Longmuir through John Gibson. But I never met Les McEwen or any of them. Uh, are you a relation of John Gibson? My aunt, who was married to my mother's brother, her sister was John Gibson's mother. So it's like a half-cousin, if you want to put it that way. The last time I saw John Gibson, we done an interview <coughs> That's when I met Alan Longmuir, and it was down at Caprice. I meet every morning and every afternoon for a conference uh -huh. in the John Gibson room. He's got a room named after him. That's it. <laughs> I never got on Just well. I never got on well with him. I don't know what it was. He started off being a reporter, and I was one of his first big interviews. John was a prober, and I heard the story about it that with Shirley Bassey, he didn't like Shirley Bassey because she told him he was just a so and so. You know, <laughs> typical Bassey. She just let loose. She was a darling, but I loved her. I'll tell you what. My favourite person in show business, as a person going out with, was definitely Al McCogan. She never stopped. She was a great. You could go to a party and everybody would be sitting there. Al McCogan came in, everybody was all happy, just cracking gags. She was a there. Mm -hmm. And Bassey was the same. Aye. And Bassey had said something about her coming on the stage. Well, you know, Shirley was famous for the dresses. She do two songs, run off the stage, and then the dress on it says, I came to see Shirley Bassey, not a model, or something like that, and she called him. And of course, he knew that I knew Shirley, and I saw she's a lovely person. That was it. She called me everything. I said, well, she got a point. She's entitled to say her opinion. But that's how I knew John Gibson. When did you first have the realisation that you were Scotland's first pop star? Just recently. <laughs> <laughs> honest, honest, I always maintained it was Lonnie Donegan and Nancy Whiskey, who's never been mentioned. Mm. Free train, free train. Which has McDavid. Nobody has mentioned Nancy Whiskey in any of these Nancy programs. Whiskey. I'd never heard of her. No. In all that was the number one. What was her surname? Nancy Whiskey. They played here, the Empire, with Chas McDavid and Nancy Whiskey. No. And she sang, Free Train, Free Train. I know free train going so fast. Free... So... Well, I mean, that's awfully honourable of you to. <laughs> no. But... <laughs> Pass on the But the thing is, to someone else, they but... said it was actually on. The, the show that we've done, they said, but you were the first, because they were born in Scotland, mm -hmm. but they went to England, so they were in England when they made their I name. I didn't realise that Lonnie Donegan was... Um, he was born in Glasgow. Uh, and I knew that. Or indeed Donovan, I didn't realise Donovan. Because when Lonnie Donegan came out, it was Skiffle. Nazareth. And Nazareth. Nazareth were a Skiffle group. And so was uh, Lonnie Donegan. The only thing I didn't know about the show, I've never heard of them, I'm sorry to say. The Beat Stalkers Aye, from class. I've they never, been, ever they heard of them. They could bigger than the Beatles, I think. Yeah. Oh, I haven't heard of them either. They're quite prominent in the exhibition as well. I've never heard of them. No. And I know the Beatles, when they first came up to Scotland, they were on a £40 a night. That was all they were getting. Aye. And Epstein, they were staying in rotten digs. And when I was in so Hamburg... That's £40 a show. Yeah. Forty pound a show, so they had to perform to get that wage. Aye. And I know. So you were on a better deal than them. Oh, really? Because it was hundred to myself. Mm -hmm. Was only that a hundred a week? A hundred a week, yeah. Whatever show I'd done, I got a hundred. Television also was worked into that. If I'd done a TV program, it was still a hundred pound I got. So for each performance, it wasn't like a weekly wage. You had to take to the stage to get paid, basically. No, no. 
even TV. I never got any money from TV that was included. It was like £100 per week, oh. per week. And my mother would get, I think it was £20 a month. That's how my mother got. But £20 a month was a lot of money. Jim, mm. My dad was working 10 hours and only getting about £3.50 well, you or something about, like that. You hear about top footballers in that day, like you know, Bobby Tarleton well, or George Best or something, getting £12, £14 yeah. pounds a week. The greatest players I ever, who I met a few times, was Gordon Smith, who was my idol. Getting nothing. Changed times. I wanted to touch upon your time, early, early 60s, mid 60s, you're in London, you were living in London for a spell, uh -huh. right? That's right. Is it right that you were neighbours with John Lennon and Cynthia? Yes, it made a veil. They, they lived along the, the corridor and I just said hello to them and that, you know. I think one day they came, I was with Lynn then, and I think they came one day for to ask for a pint of milk or something like that. But I met them a couple of times. They were just starting off then. Uh, that was before they had the even please, please me. They had the love uh, me yeah. do, love me do. I'd uh, only got into the hip parade. Yeah. But I only met them once. But round that area made a veil in my time. There used to be a lot of stars there, like Dusty, who I said earlier on was one of the backing for me uh, with the Lana sisters. Yes. There used to be a pub down there. And we all used to meet at Made of Vale, all the artists. Madeline Bell, uh -huh. Blue Mink, Don Lime from the Six Fire Special. We used to have a wee drink, all the artists together, you know. It was it. Like all yeah, the you'd, artists. You'd be about the same age as the Beatles as well. No, I think they were a wee bit older than me. Well, I think. Man, get. Just tell I'm us just about how John Lennon borrowed a pint of milk. <laughs> And he lived just down the road from you when you were... When I lived at Made of it was at Big Flats. Yeah. Typical London, you know, it was all flats. And I was with Lynn at that time, and was a knock on the door in the morning. And this lad says, uh, then he's all, thank you very much. <laughs> you know. <laughs> then when I met, I just met him for a few times. Well, a couple of times, just said, hello to you. It's brilliant. It's brilliant at his side. You know. <laughs> and he said, oh. And the next, next I knew, because I'd seen them in Hamburg with Tommy Steele. Really? Yeah. When they were doing the, the things, we went to this club, Tatty Club, and somebody says about this. They weren't called the Beatles then, they were working as the quarry men or quarry something man. like that. So in the Reaper Band in Hamburg? Aye. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so a right right dive, a right dive. And they came <laughs> on and I said, oh, what a bloody racket. And we walked out, Tommy and I. I think Tommy, somehow or other, must have known Brian Epstein and must have said something about them. Of course, when they came back to Liverpool, Epstein signed them up. But the Were you surprised to see that transformation from what you'd seen in Hamburg? I mean, oh, for goodness sake, aye. They were wild. The Beatles <laughs> were wild. And all the group, all the junkies and everything. I thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not sitting uh, here. Because I was only about, maybe I'd be only about 16 or 17. Uh, and we just says, you fancy, Tommy said, well, fancy going into a club just to see what the entertainment's like. And they said, this group, the Quarrymen. And I'm trying to think, Tony Crombie, mm. who used to be Tony, Tony Crombie and the Rockets, and they did this song, which was a big hit in Germany. My bunny lies over. It was terrible, you know, and I'm saying, oh, this is terrible, I'm going out of here. <laughs> and they were. But Epstein, the nice jackets, the nice haircuts, which they copied off of the Three Studios. You remember the st Three Studios years ago? You had a haircut like that. And that was it. Then, of course, when Please Please Me, they were the biggest thing ever. And your Rolling Stones and the Beatles, they're the biggest thing that ever happened. You're going to women entertainers, Shirley Bassey, she can travel all over the world and still doing it. I would love to. I used to always say, I'd like to be in show business like Bing Crosby, because mm -hmm. he was in it for years, but I never achieved that, because different cult came along, like it's all changed now. You've got all this rap music, which I just <laughs> cannot get into. Bing was very lucky to have the long career that he had. I be, seemingly was a, a nasty man too, so I heard, you know. I know that him and Bob Hope, although they made movies, they didn't like each other. <laughs> it was a problem. There's a box on it, boy. As Bing would say, my boy. <laughs>
I think you've got to count yourself lucky no matter what, though, because, I mean, it's a pyramid, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, there's a you know, the number of people who try to make it and never get there. Yeah. I mean, at least you, you did taste the success. Yeah. There's only a very small percentage who go on to, for you know, enjoy I'm, longevity and all this kind of well, thing. Well, I'm going to tell you something, David. Nobody talks about them. We were in the same school at Leaf Academy, and a young lad, his stage name, his real name was Johnny Locke, L-O-C-K-E. Played trumpet and sang, right? And Johnny Locke went down to London before me and recorded a song for Fontana, which was a small label. Was it in your year? Yes. This before I even went down to London, right? Somebody had seen him. He was on the Carol Levis Discovery Shows, played the Empire. Remember Carol Levis? You've heard of Carol Levis. And he won the competition here. And somebody took him down to London. And he made a record for a movie called Violent Playground. David McCallum starred in it. It was like a blackboard jungle. Teenagers at school and refusing the teacher, you know, like to sum with love, Lulu was a similar type of Cindy Putty. Yeah. And he had the back and fit song for that. But he never became a star. Didn't he sell? But he done the backing. And when I went down to London, he was there. And we met up. This is prior to me doing uh, the Six Flags special. And I says to him, how are you getting on? He says, they didn't want me on the label now. One of the most talented laddies I ever met. Honest. And that's what I say. I was in the right place at the right time. What I achieved, Johnny Lockwood achieved. Yeah. And it was sad because he was a wonderful entertainer. I'd love to know what happened to him. Honest, I would, and I'd like to meet up with him. I could have been nothing if he had hit it. And that's what happens. Quite a vintage the, uh, class you had. Uh, <laughs> I mean, a vintage year yeah. at Leith Academy. Also in London at the same time as me was a young lad at 14 year old. And he was the first one to make number one in America. Hit parade. Laurie London. The whole world in his hands. What's happened to him? Have you heard of him? You know the song, he's got the whole... Mm, mm. His father wrote it. He was a big Jewish boy. But he never made it. He was on the Six Five special the same time as me, okay. on the birthday show. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, we don't see so many teenage stars. No, I think the last think... teenage star that we really had from Britain was mm. young Lena Zavaroni. You know, there's not many... Do you think that it's too young, though? I mean, 15, to be going out there and, and doing what you did? Yeah. And I think most of them, and even the basic rulers are still young lads, you're going to be exploited. But when you've got a knowledge of show business, like Evie Taylor, mm -hmm. my agent, handled Val Dunican, it was only a 10%, mm -hmm. because Val Dunican had been in the business for years, and they knew exactly, I'm not saying in that, yeah. that if you want me, that's how much you're going to get. He could make his own terms. Epstein, definitely, yeah. with the Beatles, everybody was exploited. I mean, despite the fact that you were ripped off, it sounds like you had a good relationship with Evie. You weren't abused in the way that Elvis was by the Colonel and that kind of thing. No. Um, I would never run Evie Taylor down. Yeah. If it wasn't for Evie Taylor, I wouldn't be sitting here and telling you all my stories. I was proud of what I'd done. I was wriggled in the end. In my mind, I says, I've been ripped off. But then I say to myself, I've done everything I wanted to do. So what am I worried about? And people will still come up to me. I've been called a has-been. I've been in a, in a pub having a drink or, or a club. And somebody's came up, oh, you're a has-been. And I've turned around and I says, yeah. I said, where are you going on holiday? And I said, oh, we're just going to North Berwick or something like that. I said, well, I've been all over the world. You can't take it away so from how me. Many <laughs> how many And they look at me and they say, I beg your pardon. And they will shake hands with me. There can't be many people from this island who have footage of themselves performing on American television no. in the 1950s. Yeah. I mean, the fact that that exists is incredible. And How did it feel watching the show last night? Did you see the show? Yeah, it brought back a, a lot of memories. To me, the show itself, I thought, showed up. There was a lot, like I'm talking with young Johnny Locke. There were so many good entertainers in Scotland that never made it for the simple reason is they had to go down to London. It's all changed now. And it was Nazareth, and people like that it says, we'll make a range studios. Yeah. We'll fight against this mm -hmm. crowd at London. 
It's happening all over. You've got it like London. Who needs another uh, runway? Come on, spending all that money on. I would not like to have a house there and planes coming in. Yeah. And this is what happened all the time. If you were in London, the Beatles had to go down to London to be famous. Rolling Stones were there because they were Londoners. That's a different thing. But how many groups had to go to London? Most of them. And it was, I would say, 90% for to make their name. And you were how old when you went down there when you moved? 15 year old. I was just a baby. I just thought, I just left school six weeks before and then got a job. Two weeks as an apprentice plumber. When you left school, did you have any idea about what was going to happen to you? Well, I thought I was just going to be a plumber and I'd be still do my shows. So six still... weeks prior, leaving school? Yeah. You've no idea that in a matter of weeks, months' time, you're going to be jetting off to America? Yeah. Two weeks as an apprentice plumber, straight down to London, three weeks later, four weeks later, you could say within two months, I was... Where were you performing when Mike and Bernie Winters? Presswick Airport. It was a, an American base in Presswick Airport oh, then. Yeah. Which Elvis visited? Elvis stopped off there. Yeah. That's the only time he set foot in Britain. But that was before, you know, before he went into the army. But uh, yeah, it's, it's quite serendipitous it's, it's in a way. It's a similar yeah. thing. And I was doing this show. I was paid 30 bob, mm -hmm. £1.50 or something like that for this show. And transport taken through. And I, I used to sing with my Tant and Trousers and things like that. And Mike and Benny Winters were there, and Des, my best friend ever. Des? Des Lane, Penny Whistleman. Played Empire so many times, always second top of the bill. Lovely guy. The, the best friend I've ever had in my life. Des Lane. Yeah, who helped me a lot. He understood. Des used to phone me up and say, I've got the car outside. Come down, let's go for a wee drive. Take me away from sitting in dressing rooms and things like that. It was brilliant. It was what like What were you doing all the way over there at the age of 15? Just left school. I mean, what Presswick, it's a long way to go. Yeah, but as I said, I'd done shows since I was eight year old. Yeah. And I went over there, somebody invited me for to go over to this American camp. And that was January. It was just after Christmas or something like that. And I went around and done my wee show. And I didn't know that Mike and Benny Winters were there, and Des, uh, Margot Henson, Sam Kemp, they had all been from pantomime and they were invited. And they said, that's it, we'll get in contact with your agent. A couple of weeks later, phone rings at my home. My mother says, it's a Miss Taylor, I want to speak to you. And she said, I <laughs> you know, and told me everything. I've arranged for you to come down and so on. So I said, oh, I'll have to get a day off. I says, because I'm a plumber. <laughs> she says, well, hmm. if you get the air, I'm going to go so on, so on, so on. Where was she from? Oh, she was a typical Yorkshire. You know, hello, Rose, hello. <laughs> Real, hmm. you know. Put me in mind, I don't know if you remember Hilda Baker. She said, oh, you know. <laughs> anyway, went uh, down to London. So on, so on, so on, so six, five special first. Sign them up. We want them for the birthday show, which is in four weeks' time. Went round to Decca, done with eight bars of your song, and he says, brilliant, coincide with the 6 5 specially, you know, record mm -hmm. a song. I got the chance to two songs, la -dee da or get a, get a job. And I liked la -dee da Because my father, when he used to wash the windows, used to say, I'm away out today, a la -dee da And I says, that's an omen. Which it was. And it came in, that was the thing it made me. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that was it. And I never looked back after that. For five years, I was still very, very big. I could do things like go on the shows, the London Palladium, Sunday night at London Palladium, work with people like Max Bygraves, Frankie Vaughan, you know, on their television yeah, shows, yeah. David Nixon, The Great Conjurer, things like that. I'd, I had a lot of success. You've always maintained it. It wasn't the happiest time of your life. You talk, was, you talk about your days in, the, in working in the care home. Yeah, I was more at ease. There was always a thing in show business, you can't do that, you can't go out, so and so and so and so. Mm -hmm. And a 15 year old, I never had any of my pals who were in Edinburgh. The only time I saw them was when I came back to do pantomime. 
and they'd come backstage, but they were frightened to come backstage because they thought, oh, Jackie, I've no one to know us now. And I used to say, a lot, I want to see you all. We went, used to go at the back there. I'd say to them, come up at four o'clock, you know, mm-hmm. before the show started at 6.25 and 8.15, I think it was, you know, the two, you shows, two shows. Right, that's right. Back to back, yeah. yeah. And I used to say, come up at four o'clock and we'd have a kick around, kind of the back there. Yeah. <laughs> So still you, there, you, the I'm still there, right? Do you sympathise with a lot of these pop stars? I mean, like we talk about Michael Jackson and oh, characters Mike. like this. And you never had a life. The way that they kind of came off the rails and their life went a certain way. Do you sympathise with that? Oh yeah, without a doubt. Because I was a 15-year-old laddie. I never had a life in show business. It was from one thing to another. A dressing room, television studios, film studios, so and so and so and so. Onto the theatre, boom. And I used to say, I've not had any spare time for myself. Did you have time back here with the family? No, I stayed with my family for a week. Because of the fans and everything, I stayed at the hotel. And I stayed uh, along at the um, Caledonian. That was the only thing I could do. But then I turned around and I refused. When the show, the pantomime went over to Glasgow and you said the hotel, I said, no, I'm going to stay with my cousins. I said, I can't be bothered, I, I don't like, I'm sitting in a hotel all day and I can't even go out. At least with my cousins I could go out. Although, I was stopped in the street and said, can we have your autograph and things like this, which I didn't mind, it was freedom, I just wanted to get out. Michael Jackson, the relationship he had with his father, who just died recently, Joe, that wee lad, he was, had no life. That's why he made this big place, what was it called? Neverland. 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 He had no life. He was a baby. That was the same as me. It's At least the Beatles and Bay City Rollers were old enough that they could go and associate and go into a pub and have a drink, the four of them together or whatever, you know. Do you feel in a sense that you handed over that part of your life, you know, the sort of the end phase of your youth in a sense to, you know, yeah, to, to feed that show biz- success? Yeah, show business dominated my life. It, like I, I said, I loved movies. I never saw the beginning of a movie or saw the end of a movie because I had to come out of that theatre. Mm. The Ritz down in Rodney Street, which is away now. I lived in Broken Road. I used to phone them up and say, can I come over and watch the, the matinee show? Yeah, Jackie. The dress circle was closed, Jackie, and we'll let you in there. I had freedom. I could sit in the dress circle, wait until everybody went out of the theatre and then go out. But other places, Liverpool or wherever I was performing, bodyguards were there. Many times I've been flung into cars going at about 50 miles per hour and jumping out. It's hard going, really hard going. And that's that's what your life is. You've got to sacrifice all these things. And all I wanted today was go out and have a, a kick of the football, because I love football, which I still do. It's done chips. <laughs> How many times have you sat and wondered what might happen if you just continued working as a plumber? I've sat and, and thought that over and I've said to myself, well, we'll have never achieved what I've got now. And people come up and say, you were the first Scotsman to be in the hip parade. You were the first British artist to go over to America. No, as a plumber, I couldn't do that. But I might have been happy. Whereas I was happy in that care home. Cause Everything was flowing. I could go out and sit there with the old folk and have a chat with them and things like that. Do you feel that period in your life made up for some of the emotional stuff that you did? Hundred percent. The happiest I've ever been was in that home. Well, my wife was here, or my family. They would tell you the same thing. I used to start doing shifts, and if I started at seven o'clock, I was up at five o'clock to get there just wanted to be there. I didn't need to be there till seven o'clock, but I was in that home just seeing if Mrs. Wilson was all right. Didn't need to do that, but I did it because I loved every minute of that. To me, it was me looking after someone that needed my help. And then I reflected on myself, I needed someone for help me. You weren't looked after. And I wasn't looked after. And that's it, and I've said it hundreds of times to people. Any reporter I say the happiest times I've ever had was when I was looking after someone. 
I'm a happy, I've got a lovely family. Who needs show business? Many thanks to Jackie for his time and his memories, and to Jack and David for conducting the interview. More episodes of Life Story can be found at Spotify and Apple Podcasts, as well as at lifestory.libson.com. If you have enjoyed this podcast, we have others. Just pop along to our website, www.livingmemory.org.uk, and follow the link on our homepage. You can also learn more about our work, or trawl through our photo archive. We have over three and a half thousand photos for you to look at check us out on facebook under living memory association or for podcasts thelma fm we also have a twitter account thank you very much for listening and enjoy our other content